we'll now start to look at my angle construction theorems. And we start with the angle construction postulate. And the angle construction postulate is going to be our next axiom, axiom 11. We start with the fact that we need a line AB, a half plane determined by that line, and a real number between and including 0 to 180. Then there's going to exist exactly one ray AP in our half plane H, such that the measure of angle PAB is equal to R. So this essentially says if you have a line and the side of the plane, you're able to construct an angle of any given size. Our first result says that if we have a given point A on a line L, there exists one and only one line M perpendicular to L at A. This is going to be an immediate result of our angle construction postulate. Essentially, we're going to start with a line, a, a line L and pick a point on it A. Well, by letting R be equal to 90 degrees, our angle construction postulate says there's exactly one ray P, AP, such that the measure of that angle is 90 degrees. And if I extend that ray, I get the unique line. So this is an immediate result of our angle construction postulate letting R be equal to 90. The next result we're going to look at is the angle construction theorem. The angle construction theorem says, let's suppose we have two non-degenerate, non-straight angles, ABC and DEF. And we know that the measure of angle ABC is less than the measure of angle DEF. Then there's a unique ray EG lying between my rays ED and EF, such that angle GEF is congruent to angle ABC. So essentially, if I have a larger angle, I can build this smaller angle inside of it. Let's actually look at the proof of this. I'm going to start by letting H be the half plane determined by line EF containing the point D. So I know DEF is an angle. I'm going to go ahead and extend the ray EF to a line, and then consider the half plane that actually contains that point D. There's going to be exactly one ray EG in H such that angle GEF is congruent to angle ABC by this axiom 11. So we have that they're congruent, and now we just need to show that ray EG actually lies between these two rays. We know that G cannot lie on either the line ED or the line EF. If it was on the line EF, then it wouldn't be in the half plane determined by line EF, so that can't work. And if it was on the line ED, then it would have been congruent to angle DEF in the first place. But we specifically said that angle DEF was larger. Therefore, it's either in the interior of angle DEF or in the interior of angle DEF prime, where we have FEF prime between this relation. So we want the first of these to be true. We want it to be in the interior of angle DEF. So we're going to assume that it's not we're going to assume that it's in the interior of angle DEF prime and get a contradiction. If G is in the interior of angle DEF prime, then we know the measure of angle GEF prime plus the measure of angle GED is equal to the measure of angle DEF prime by axiom 10, our angle addition postulate. Using our linear pair theorem or the idea of supplementary angles, we can rewrite this as 180 minus the measure of angle GEF plus the measure of angle GED is equal to 180 minus the measure of angle DEF. We can then rewrite that as the measure of angle DEF plus the measure of angle GED is equal to the measure of angle GEF, which is the same as the measure of angle ABC since those angles are congruent. We then have that measure of angle DEF has to be smaller than the measure of angle ABC. Since we have the measure of angle DEF plus some other positive number to get to the measure of angle ABC. But that contradicts is our hypothesis in the first place that the measure of angle ABC was smaller. Therefore, G cannot lie in the interior of angle DEF prime, and it must be in the interior of angle DEF, which gives us the other condition that this ray is between the two rays ED and EF. For this, we're going to assume ray BD 
lies between these two rays B, A, and B, C, as demonstrated in my picture here. We also need that the measure of angle A, B, D is the same as the measure of angle D, B, C. In this case, we call this ray B, D the bisector of angle A, B, C. Our next result is gonna be the angle bisection theorem. Our angle bisection theorem says that each non-degenerate, non-straight angle has a unique bisector. And this is gonna be a direct result of our angle construction theorem, so we don't need to prove this. In this case, we do need it to be non-degenerate and non-straight. And it's interesting to consider the theorem that would go along with this for the case of a straight angle. So I encourage you to kind of think through the case of the straight angle. Is the bisector defined? If so, would there be more than one? And if there is what, more than one, what makes the bisector of a non-straight angle unique, whereas the bisector of a straight angle would not be? So I encourage you to kind of think through these questions.